we'd like to look at. But before we get started with that, let's bow our heads for a short prayer. Dear Father, once more as we open up the Bible, we recognize that this is your book. And in order for us to understand it correctly, we need the Holy Spirit's guidance. Thank you, Father, for this time. And we ask your special blessing with us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Last year, I spent some time in India. And if you folks have been to India, anyone here perhaps been in India, you know that there's a lot of people in India. And the people in India are very religious, most of which are Hindu. The Hindus worship a vast number of gods all over the city. You will find little idols, little shrines to these different gods. Most of these gods represent some mystic being that used to live on earth, but then died and now has become a god to which the people worship. There is a lot of confusion in the world today about what happens when a person dies. Does he go to a higher plane? Does he go to hell? Does he go to heaven? Does he end up in some holding place somewhere? What happens when a person dies? In the Bible, we find in Revelation chapter 118, Jesus speaking these words. He says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. Now the word hell here in Revelation 118 literally means the grave. In other words, Jesus says that he knows what will happen when a person dies. Why? Well, because he was dead, and behold, he is alive forevermore, and he has the keys of the grave and the keys of death. When Jesus says that he has the keys of the grave, what does he mean? Firstly, that he alone can unlock the dark prison house of death and set its captives free. That's good news. Jesus can set sin's captives free, set the captivity of those who are bound in the grave free. Secondly, that he alone can unlock the dark mysteries of death and tell us what it means. There are seven keys that we would like to look at tonight. Seven keys that unlock the mystery of death. Key number one, how life began. If we want to understand what's going to happen when life ends, well, let's first figure out how life began in the beginning. We begin in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Listen carefully. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Please notice what was needed for man to become a living soul. According to this verse, there was the dust of the ground or the clay that God formed man out of, then God breathed into man the spirit of life or the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Then it tells us in Genesis 2 verse 9, And out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant for sight, good for food. The tree of life also was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So in the beautiful garden of Eden, God planted two trees. The one was the tree of life, the other was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said to Adam and Eve, you can eat of the tree of life, but don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God and ate of the forbidden tree, we read in Scripture that God sent Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden so they wouldn't have access to the tree of life. Because if they ate of the tree of life, they would live forever and sin would become immortal. Listen to what happened. Life is a direct personal gift from God. The tree of life was a continual reminder that man did not have life in and of himself. Should he ever be cut off from access to the tree, uh, life-giving tree, his existence would inevitably cease. Key number two then, how did death begin? A familiar story. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, has God said, You shall not eat of every tree in the garden. Now, who is the serpent? Is this just a snake that we're talking about? The serpent, of course, represents Satan. Satan came in the form of a snake. Revelation chapter 12 says, That old serpent of old, the dragon called Satan. So Satan said to the woman, And you shall not, or you shall not eat of the tree of the garden. Then it goes on, And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. Now what did God say to Adam and Eve? 
He said, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he warned them, if you do, the consequences will be death. The devil came in the form of a serpent, and he said to Adam and Eve, no, you can go ahead and eat of this tree. You will not die. So here we find the devil contradicting a clear statement made by God. Here's the steps. Number one, Satan contradicts God's warning and says, you shall not surely die. Man believes Satan's lie and disobeys God. The result is disobedience, separation from the tree of life, Genesis 3. And so death is passed upon all men, Romans chapter 5, verse 12, for all have sinned. The second key that we want to look at, how death begins, continuing, in spite of these plain Bible facts, the idea persists in many minds that man, even as a sinner, is naturally immortal, so that some part of him can never die. Millions have been deceived by the devil's false assurance, you shall not surely die. This is the root of all of this widespread confusion about life, death, and immortality. It finds its beginning in that lie perpetrated by Satan. You will not surely die. Well, the third key that we want to consider, we've looked at how life began. We looked at how death began. The third key, what happens to the body at death? Well, we don't have to spend too much time. It's fairly clear, I think, to all of us. Hebrews 3.19, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return to the ground from out of it thou wast taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. I think it's clear to all of us that the body eventually goes back into dust or into ash. No mystery there. Genesis 3.19 is clear. The body returns to the earth. All human experience confirms this plain, this plain statement from the Bible. Key number four, what happens to the spirit at death? Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. Then shall the dust return unto the earth. What is the dust here in this verse? The body, right? Then shall the dust return unto the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. In this verse, we see the reverse of Genesis, where God made man out of the dust of the earth and then breathed into him his spirit or his breath. Man became a living soul or a living being. In death, the body returns to the ground or to the dust, and that spark of life, that breath of life, that spirit of life returns to God who gave it. Job chapter 34, verse 14 and 15, If he set his heart upon man, if he gather unto himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh shall perish together, and the man shall turn again unto the dust. So do you understand what happens then at death? It's just the exact opposite of when God created life in the beginning. The body returns to the ground, to dust. The spirit or the breath returns to God who gave it. Now this text does not say that the spirit of good men only return to God at death. No distinction is made here between good men and bad men. According to this passage, the spirit of all men return to God at death. Now when we're talking about the spirit, we are talking about that essence of life, that spark of life that comes from God. Both bad and good share in that spark of life, that essence of life. Uh, scientists would give all kinds of things to have access to that spark of life. It is impossible for man to create life, even in its simplest form. But life is a gift of God. It comes from God. That is this breath, the spirit that brings life. But there's not, nothing in this verse that separates good spirit from bad spirit. Simply that spark of life, that spirit of life shared by all of God's creation returns to God at death. According to the Bible, the spirit is the life principle or the breath of life, which God originally gave to man and to beast. The common Hebrew word for breath, ruach, is many times translated interchangeably as spirit and breath. In the Hebrew, spirit and breath is the same word. In Genesis, where it says the spirit of the Lord moved upon the waters, it's the breath of the Lord. God breathed into Adam and he became a living being. That's the spirit of God. That's the breath of God. That's the essence of life that God has given to all of his creation. 
Nowhere does the Bible teach that the human spirit has the power of independent consciousness or intelligence or emotions or sensation, memory or will prior to or subsequent to his union with the body. The recognition of this fact will also save us from a great deal of confusion. The spirit that returns to God is the spark of life. It's not who we are. It's not our identity. Key number five in understanding the mystery of death. What happens to the soul at death? Now, this is probably where it gets a little more confusing for some people. What happens to the soul? Does it go to heaven? If it's good, does it go to hell? What does the Bible say? This might come as a surprise to some of you. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 4 says, Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. And notice the last part of the verse. It says, the soul that sins, what will happen to it? It shall die. That's fairly clear. The soul that sins, it will die. When the Bible uses the word soul, it's speaking of self. It's speaking of our being. You know, one time, I, my wife went to the shopping mall, and she came back, and I said, how did things go at the mall? And she said, well, there wasn't a soul there. I was the only one. Now, obviously, I understood that when she spoke about a soul, she was speaking about other people, right? She wasn't talking about ghosts floating around. We often refer to soul as being people or ourselves. The soul simply means a breathing, living creature. The Bible says the soul that sins, it shall die. That's fairly clear. Key number five, what happens to the soul? According to the Bible, a living soul is a living being, a conscious, per, conscious person or personality, an individual. In Matthew 16, 26 and in Luke 9, 25, the Bible uses the term soul and self interchangeably. Obviously, the soul means the self, the whole man, the total conscious, living, breathing personality as it functions normally in life. So when we're talking about the soul, we're talking about ourselves. It's talking about our thinking, our emotions, our feelings, the entity of what makes us who we are. At death, the soul or the self with all of its wonderful powers simply ceases for the time being to exist. The soul does not go anywhere at death. It simply lapses into non-being as a conscious entity. Now, let me explain this for just a minute. Let's say that I have some wood piled up right here and I have a little box of nails and I decide to build a box. So I take the wood, and I take the nails, and I have a hammer, and so I knock some nails in, and I, I build a little wooden box. Well, then after a while, I say, well, I'm tired of my box, and so I pull out all of the nails, and I put the nails back in their pile, and I pile up the wood back in its pile, so I have nails and I have wood. The question is, where did the box go? Did the box go to the corner of the room? Did the box go to heaven? Did the box go to hell? No, the box simply ceased. Does that make sense? We are a living soul. We are a breathing, living creature. It's body or dust and the breath of life, the Spirit of God. When a person dies, the spirit returns to God. The body returns to the earth. The soul ceases to be until the resurrection. Then at the resurrection, God recreates the body once more, this time immortal, and he puts within it that breath of life, that spirit of life. Once more, the person is a living soul. Well, let's see what else the Bible says on this topic. Ecclesiastes 9, 5, and 6. Listen to this verse. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. So the Bible says that those who are alive, they know what's happening. But a person who has died, he is unconscious of anything. The dead know not anything. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. So someone who has died, they don't love anymore. They don't hate anymore. They cannot envy. That is all ceased when the person dies. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10 Whatsoever thou hand findeth to do, do it with all of thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. There is no might, no work, no device, no knowledge, no wisdom in the grave. Psalm 6 verse 5, For in death there is no remembrance of thee, 
in the grave, who shall give thee thanks? In other words, those that die, they don't praise God. They are in the grave waiting for the resurrection. Psalms 115 verse 17, The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. Now if the soul goes straight to heaven, according to this verse, it's not praising God. For the dead cannot praise the Lord. Does that make sense? Are these verses fairly clear? In Acts chapter 2 verse 29, we have the story of David. Paul is preaching. And now we know that David was a good man, and we expect that David will be in heaven. But listen to what Paul had to say. Uh, Verse 29, Acts 2. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. So here Paul is just stating the obvious. David is dead. That's basically what he's saying. And his grave, his sepulcher is over here. Then he goes on in verse 34 and says, For David is not yet ascended into heaven. So David has been dead for a number of years by the time of Paul, and Paul is very clear that David is not yet ascended to heaven, but he saith of himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou here on my right hand. So in Paul's mind, David had not yet ascended to heaven. David was a good man, but he had not yet ascended to heaven. Now, it's important for us to note, as we unlock the mystery of death according to the Bible, that the Bible again and again likens death to a sleep. Now, if you've worked all day and you are tired and you lay down on your pillow, the next thing you know, that alarm clock is ringing. And you think, oh man, is it time to get up already? I just closed my eyes. I just fell asleep. Time had gone by so quickly. So likewise it is with someone who loves Jesus and they breathe their last and they die. The very next thing they know is Jesus is coming in the clouds of heaven. He's coming to take them home. They don't realize that 10, 15, 20, 100, 200, 2,000, 4,000 years has passed. To them, it seems it's just a moment. You close your eye, and the very next thing you know, Jesus is coming. That's how quickly it will be to someone who loves Jesus and dies. Just like when you are sleeping, you're not aware of the time. So likewise, someone who's dead, they aren't aware of how much time goes by. The next thing they know, if they love Jesus, Jesus is coming to take them home. 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 10, speaking of David, we just read about him in Acts. So David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. Notice the Bible speaks of death as a sleep. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52. Behold, Paul says, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be all changed or be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. The great hope of the Christian is the resurrection that takes place at the second coming of Jesus. Now, somebody might say, well, if when you die and your soul goes straight to heaven or straight to hell, and when Jesus comes again, why is there a need for a resurrection? After all, you're already in heaven. You see, the purpose of the resurrection is to once again unite men and women, families, friends, loved ones at the time of the second coming. If there was no need for that, if people died and went straight to heaven, you wouldn't need a resurrection. But the Bible speaks of this glorious event, this wonderful resurrection. Over 50 times in the Bible, death is compared to a sleep. Because when a person is asleep, he is unconscious to the things around him. Sleep is always only a temporary condition, and I want you to notice that, which carries with it the promise of a certain awaking. You see, death is not something that the Christian needs to fear. Because our hope is in Jesus, when that time comes for us to lay down the burdens of this life, we can rest in assurance that Jesus will call our name when He comes in the clouds of glory to take us home. That's good news, amen? Absolutely. Key number six, when death's power is broken. This is good news. Listen to Job, Job 14, 12 through 15. He says, So man lieth down and riseth not, till the heavens be no more, they shall not awake nor raise out of their sleep. Now, obviously... Job is speaking of something more here than just taking a rest. He's speaking of death. 
And he says, a person will lie down and he will not move. He will not be raised until the heavens be no more. Now, when does that happen? That happens at the second coming of Christ. For the Lord himself descends from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. Second Peter chapter 3 says, the heavens will pass away with a great noise. That's when the resurrection takes place. Verse 13, oh, that thou wouldst hide me in the grave, that thou wouldst keep me secret until thy wrath be passed, that thou wouldst appoint me a set time and remember me. So Job says, oh, that I could rest in the grave, you could hide me in the grave until a time comes. Then he goes on, verse 15, if a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time I will wait till my change come. Thou shalt call and I will answer thee. Thou wilt have a desire to the work of thy hands. So in the mind of Job, he understood that death was just a temporary thing. A person was to lay down and when Jesus comes, when the heavens pass away with a great noise, Jesus will resurrect those who love him. The sixth key when is death's power broken? The Bible teaches that uh, destiny of man does not end with the sleep of death. God has power whenever he pleases to repeat the miracle of Genesis 2 verse 7. Once more, combined the breath of life, the spirit of life with the body. He alone can reunite the body and the spirit, thus restoring life. This is what the Bible calls the resurrection of the dead. And finally, key number seven, the Christian's attitude towards death. Death is compared to a sleep, as we looked at. It's also compared to a shadow. The Christian does not need to fear death. That's good news. Paul said, henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And notice, he's speaking about a future event. Then he goes on and he says, and not to me only, but unto all of them that love his, what's that last word? Appearing. Notice in the mind of Paul, his crown, his reward would not be received at death, but rather at that special day when Jesus would come, when he, with the other resurrected saints, will receive their reward or the crown of righteousness. Friends, we've had a chance to briefly look tonight at what the Bible has to say about the subject of death. The next question that people have is, well, if when a person dies, he's sleeping the sleep of death until the resurrection, uh, what about hell? Are there people now in hell? Is hell a hot, fiery place in the middle of the earth? Is the devil in charge of hell? And so what we want to cover now is what does the Bible say about the subject of hell? Now, we don't usually like to talk about the subject of hell. We don't like to think too much about it. But to be honest, honest with you, this subject is extremely important for us to consider. And this is why. Probably no other subject has turned more people away from God than the subject of hell. A lot of thinking men and women have asked the question, how can God really be a God of love if He is going to burn people throughout all eternity? in the fires of hell for the sins that they did in a short life of 70, 80, or 90 years. Others have asked the question, if a person dies and he's bad and he goes straight to hell, that's not fair because then that would mean that Cain has been burning in hell for 6,000 years longer than Adolf Hitler. And throughout the long ages of eternity, Cain will be suffering more than Hitler. Well, that just doesn't seem fair. And a lot of people have said, if that's the kind of God, then I don't want to serve Him. I don't want anything to do with Him. So studying what the Bible has to say about the subject of hell is important. So let's take a look and see what the Bible has to say. Now, certain ideas about hell have been instilled into our minds from childhood. If we were to ask a hundred people in our neighborhood, what is your idea of hell? you would probably find that most people gave answers uh, something like this. A vast, fiery pit where sinners are kept burning forever and ever while demons armed with pitchforks gloat over the torments of the damned. Well, maybe not that poetic, but people will say, hell is a hot place and you don't want to go there, all right? Somewhere is, oh, it must be somewhere down there in the middle of the earth. That's the general idea that people have concerning hell. Is this idea supported 
in the Bible. Now, in the Bible, there are four words that are translated with the word hell into the English. The first is a Hebrew word. It's called Sheol. It's mentioned 65 times. Of course, it's in the Old Testament. It's Hebrew. Now, this Hebrew word has the general meaning of death or the state of death, the grave, the dominion of death and the grave, the sphere of death as opposed to the sphere of life. Shoal does not carry with it the idea of fire or of the conscious torment of the living, but simply death, the abode of death, both of good and of evil. The word occurs 65 times in the Old Testament. So when you read the word hell in the Old Testament, it could be this word Sheol, which simply means death, not a hot, fiery, burning place. And here's an example of that. Genesis 37, 35, it says, And all of his sons and all of his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, For I will go down to the grave. That word there, grave, can also be translated as hell, it's Sheol, unto my son mourning, thus his father wept over him. This is speaking about when um, the news was brought back to Jacob that Joseph was killed. Remember, his brothers sold him into slavery and he went down into Egypt and they took his multicolored coat and killed a lamb and spilt the blood and then they took the the coat back to his father. And Jacob said, I'm going to go down into into the grave. The word there is shoal, shoal. The next word that we find translated hell is a Greek word, tartaros. It refers to the place of banishment of the evil angels and evidently means the region of space surrounding this world to which the rebellious angels were cast after their expulsion from heaven. It does not concern the fate of ungodly men at all. It occurs only once in the New Testament. And here's the verse, 2 Peter chapter 4, 2 verse 4, it says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, there's the word, and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Again, it's just the abode of the wicked. It's not referring to a hot place of torment. The next word that we find in Greek referring to hell is the word Hades. And we might be common, that word might be more common to us. It literally means that which is in darkness or hidden, invisible, obscure, and applies to the unseen world or the abode of the dead. It is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word Sheol. And therefore means the grave or the dominion of death and the grave. Hades does not carry with it the idea of fire or the conscious torment of the living, but applies simply to the invisible world to which all men, good and evil alike, go at death. The word occurs 11 times in the New Testament. Well, there's one other word that's translated hell. And this one can be a little confusing. Before we get there, let me read the verse. Speaking of Jesus, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. It means the grave. Neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. That word there is translated grave or hell. It simply means the grave. The last word is Gehenna. It's a Greek word. It applies literally to the valley of Gehenna near Jerusalem, where in Christ's day all kinds of refuse were cast, including the carcasses of beasts and the unburied bodies of criminals. Fires were kept constantly burning to consume the waste materials. Gehenna is a Greek mode of spelling for the Hebrew word, which means the Valley of Hinnon. So just outside the city of Jerusalem, there was this dump. And Jesus used that as a symbol, saying, It is better for you to enter into life maimed or with one eye or losing a hand than to be cast into Gehenna. Now, by the way, it's important for us to remember that Gehenna is where they cast criminals that were dead. The bodies of dead animals, refuse. It was a place for the dead. It wasn't a place for the living to be tormented. It was the refuge dump for the city of Jerusalem. Here's the verse, um, Matthew 5, 29. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that the whole body should be cast into hell, or Gehenna, the refuse dump just outside Jerusalem. Now, why is a fiery hell of the Bible necessary? Now, now let me just back up and say the Bible does speak of a fiery hell. You can't get around that. It's there. Before we define what that is, we want to ask the question, why is it necessary? And here's a few reasons. The primary purpose of a fiery hell is to disinfect the universe from everything that is evil and unclean. 
1 John chapter 1, verse 5, God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. Darkness there is a symbol of sin. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil. Our God, listen carefully, is a consuming fire. That's for the wicked. For the sinner, God is a consuming fire. Fire is God's great antiseptic, and His use of it is to destroy evil at, la at the last day, is, to be because, is not because He is vindictive, spiteful, or cruel, but rather it is to cleanse the universe of sin. A time will come where God is going to say, there is enough pain, enough sorrow, enough suffering in the world. I'm going to cleanse the earth of all of this, and He's going to do it by fire. We're going to find out when here in just a minute. Nothing that defiles can enter the new Jerusalem. Revelation 2 verse 27. God's object is to destroy the works of the devil with this fire. God will eventually have a clean universe. All sin and sinners will be no more. How can we reconcile the Bible's picture of hell with the love and justice of God? Three points I want you to think about. Number one, God does not arbitrarily consign anyone to hell. He does not shut the door of heaven against anyone. He wants all men to be saved and has made abundant provision for this. Some people shut the door of heaven against themselves. By persistently choosing evil, they exclude themselves from heaven and consign themselves to hell. That's the first point that we need to remember. God does not enjoy seeing anyone in hell. God will have all people saved. A person chooses himself to go to hell. It's not God who arbitrarily puts a person there. Ezekiel 33 verse 11, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord, listen carefully, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God does not receive any pleasure from the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from his way and live. Turn he, turn he from your evil ways, for why will he die, O house of Israel? It's not God's will that any should perish. 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And of course, John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God has made ample provision for everyone who wants to be saved. It's by persistent rejection of God's grace that a person will end up in the fires of hell. Isaiah 28, 21, For the Lord shall rise as in Mount Perizim. He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, listen careful, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. Now this is a prophecy concerning the destruction of the wicked in hell that happens at the end of the world. It refers to this as God's strange act. It's not something God wants to do. Because God is a God of mercy. He's a God of love. But in order to cleanse the universe of sin, God will have to destroy sin and sinners and Satan and his angels. But it's God's strange act. It's not something God delights in. So the first thing, we choose whether we will be in heaven or be in hell by our own choices. Point number two. God's withdrawal of the gift of life from the wicked is in kindness to them. They would not be happy in a clean and sinless universe any more than germs would be happy in sunlight or a strong antiseptic solution. They would welcome destruction in preference to the society of God and angels. Proverbs 8, 36, But he that sinneth against me or wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me do what? Love death. Revelation 22, 11. Jesus says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. You see, right now, God's grace, His Spirit is speaking to all man. And it's God's desire that people would come to repentance. That they'd come to Jesus and say, Oh Lord, forgive me. Wash away my sins. Give me a new heart. Put your spirit within me. And just as people trust in God, He will give them power to live a holy life. That's God's purpose. That's God's plan. Jesus died on the cross so that we can be forgiven. And God is waiting for as many people as possible to be saved. But a time will come when Jesus will stand up and say, He that is holy, 
let him be holy still. And he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. Probation for the human race will then close. Just like Noah and his family. For 120 years, Noah preached that a flood was coming. And one day, God said, Noah, the time has come. You and your family go into the ark. And so they went into the ark. And the door on the ark was closed by an angel. For seven days, nothing happened. And then the rain came. And when the rain came, the people came to the ark and they pounded on the side of the ark and they said, Noah, open the door. You were right after all. Let us in. But it was too late. The door of probation had closed for those living before the flood. So likewise, just before Jesus comes, the door on human probation will close. After that door closes, Jesus will come. Let's take a look at our third point. God's withdrawal of the gift of life from the wicked is in kindness to the universe as a whole. God must safeguard the happiness and well-being of all of the universe at large. Like a surgeon who cuts out a diseased organ or amputates a poisoned limb in order to disinfect the rest of the body and set it free from the risk of disease and death. In other words, God has given people ample opportunity to choose Him, but the time will finally come when God will cleanse the earth from sin forever. This is God's strange act. Well, the next question we need to consider, are the fires of hell burning now? A few years ago, um, there was a radio talk show host who was taking Bible questions, and Somebody called up the radio station, and it was a lady that was weeping. And she asked the person there at the radio station, she said, My son was just killed in a motorcycle accident, and I want to know, is he burning in hell? Well, the talk show host didn't quite know what to say, and he said, Well, you know, God knows the heart. We can't judge people. And the woman said, No, no, he he was a wicked man. Uh, The reason he was killed was because he was drunk. Is he burning now in hell? And the man said, well, yes, he is. Well, with that, the woman burst out into tears over the phone and hung up the phone. I heard this on the, on the radio, and I said, oh, no. Oh, no, if only she would have called our radio program. We could have told her that according to the Bible, nobody is burning in hell now. No loved one is burning in hell now. The flames are not consuming people now. Hell is not taking place now. Hell comes at the end of time. Listen to what the Bible says. Matthew 13, 40 to 42. As therefore the tares are gathered and burn in the fire, a definite reference to the destruction of the wicked in hell, so shall it be when? In the end of this world. Notice Jesus says that the destruction of the wicked happens in the end of the world. The Son of Man shall send forth His angels, and they shall gather out of His kingdom all things that offend and them that do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So when does hell take place? When are the wicked cast into this fire? At the end of the earth, at the end of time. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment, to be punished. So here we are told that God delivers those who trust in Him and He will reserve the wicked to a future point in time when they will be punished. Where in the universe then will the fires of hell be located? 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation, we just read this, and to reserve the unjust until the day of judgment. For the Son of Man shall send forth His angels... I am going the wrong way. Excuse me. Here it is. Revelation 20 verse 9. I was going backwards instead of forward. Where is hell going to take place? Revelation 29. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints in the beloved city. Now this is talking about the end of the 1,000 years. Remember we studied last night. The new Jerusalem descends from God out of heaven. The wicked are resurrected in the second resurrection. They mount their attack upon the new Jerusalem. Fire comes down from God out of heaven. It says, and devours them. Um, the next verse, Proverbs eleven thirty one. 31, Behold, the righteous shall be recompensed in the earth, much more the wicked and sinners. So the reward of the righteous will ultimately be the new earth, recreated 
but the wicked will receive their punishment in the earth as well at the end of the 1,000 years. How long will the fires of hell burn? Will people burn forever and ever and ever in hell? Malachi chapter 4, 1 to 3. For behold, the day cometh that it shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yes, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Notice what the Bible says, the wicked shall be burnt up, and there will be left neither root nor branch. But you that fear my name, shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I do this, saith the Lord. So the fires of hell will eventually go out. Things will eventually be turned to ashes. When the wicked mount their attack upon the new Jerusalem, as described in Revelation chapter 20, fire comes down from God out of heaven. It devours the wicked. That same fire that consumes the wicked will purify the earth. And when the fires have finally gone out, then God creates a new earth where there is peace and joy and happiness. God recreates the earth into what it was back in the days of Eden. Jude chapter 1 verse 7. The Bible says, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now somebody said, well, hang on a minute. There it says the fire is eternal. But notice, we're talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. And Jude says that Sodom and Gomorrah suffered the vengeance of of eternal fire. Is Sodom and Gomorrah burning today? Well, the answer is no. Sodom and Gomorrah are somewhere under the Dead Sea in Palestine. But the vengeance that they suffered, this eternal fire, the fire that destroyed the cities, left the cities desolate forever. The results of the fire were eternal, not the fire itself. Does that make sense? The cities were never rebuilt. The results of the fire was forever. So likewise the fire that destroys the wicked. The results of the destruction of the wicked will be forever. The wicked will never live again. They will never have a chance to walk upon the earth. The consequences of the fire is forever. But the fire doesn't burn on throughout eternity. It says, turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that afterwards should live ungodly. So quite clearly, the Bible says that this eternal fire turns Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes and that it's an example for the ungodly. Now in the Bible, when we read about the subject of both what happens when a person dies, as well as when we study the subject of hell, several things come to mind. First of all, God is a God of love. He's a God of mercy. It is not God's will that anyone should perish. We also discover from Scripture that death is just a sleep, especially for those that love Jesus. The next thing they know, Jesus will be coming in the clouds of heaven, and He will come to take His children home forever. They will be with God. Now, someone might say, well, hang on a minute. Isn't there a story in the Gospel of Luke about uh, a rich man and Lazarus? Uh, have you heard that story, the rich man and Lazarus, recorded in the Gospel uh, in Luke? Well, what about that? Well, let's take a look at that. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to it. Luke chapter 16, I believe it is. By the way, the point that we want to emphasize here is that this is a parable. The parable is to prove a point or teach a point. Here it is, Luke chapter 16. It starts in verse 19. Jesus says, And there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fed sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus what was his name? Lazarus, keep that in the back of your mind, which laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed of the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Uh, what, who licked his sores? Dogs. That's significant too. Uh, the Jews looked at the Gentiles as dogs, as an unclean thing. Then it says, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Where was he taken? Not to heaven. He was taken to... Abraham's bosom. The rich man died and he was buried. Where was the rich man? Buried. All right. 
And in hell, or the grave, he lifted up his eyes, being tormented, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried, and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in the flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember, thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all of this, between us, you and there, is a great gulf fixed. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can you pass to us, if you would. Verse 27, Then said he, I pray thee therefore, Father Abraham, that thou would send him, that's Lazarus, to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that they may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto them, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went to them from the dead, they would repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one was risen from the dead. The reason we know this is a parable is, number one, this rich man who is in the grave is tormented, and he calls out to someone in Abraham's bosom. What is Abraham's bosom? Secondly, he asks that a drop of water be placed on his tongue. Do people who so-called burn in hell have tongues? No, they don't, right? The body, the tongue is in the grave. Secondly, can people in heaven talk to people in hell? No. Can they correspond back and forth? No. God says, or Abraham says to this person in hell, he says, I'm sorry, we can't come by. And what good would a drop of water do on somebody's tongue anyway? What is the point of this parable? There is a point. Just a few days before Jesus told this parable, there was a real man by the name of Lazarus who had been dead for three days, for four days by the time Jesus gets there. And Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead and the scribes and Pharisees symbolized in this parable by the rich man refused to believe that Jesus was the Messiah even though someone was raised from the dead. And the point of the parable is they have Moses and the prophets. If they don't receive the testimony concerning Christ in Scripture, they won't believe even if someone was raised from the dead. Does that make sense? This is not a new doctrine or teaching about what happens when someone dies, but rather Jesus is illustrating the truth to the Pharisees that they wouldn't believe even if someone was raised from the dead, and he gave the name of the person that was to be raised. This is not teaching that when a person dies, it goes to heaven and hell. Somebody else might say, well, you know, what what about the, the verse there about that thief that was hanging next to Jesus on the cross? Remember that story? And he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, verily I say unto you today, you shall be with me in paradise. Didn't that thief go with Jesus to paradise that day? The answer is no. And here's why. Number one, The thief wasn't expecting to go to paradise that day. What was his question that he asked Jesus? He said, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. When was the thief expecting to receive his reward? That very day? No. When Jesus would come again. Then Jesus assured that thief that very day while Jesus was hanging on the cross, he gave him the promise that he would be with him in paradise. Jesus assured that thief that day that he would be with him in paradise. Did Jesus go to paradise that day? No. Early Sunday morning, Jesus said to Mary Magdalene, do not detain me, do not cling to me. Why? For I have not yet ascended to my Father which is in heaven. Does that make sense? The thief was not expecting his reward that day. Jesus assured him though on that day that he would remember him when he came again. We can have confidence that when we go to Jesus and we ask Him to forgive us of our sins and we pray and say, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom, we can have assurance that very day when we speak those words, our names are written in the Lamb's book of life and Jesus will remember us when He comes again. That gives us hope. Let me close the session this evening by sharing just a little story with you. I remember coming home from school one day and I opened the front door and came inside and I looked at my parents and I realized something was wrong. Uh, They were crying and uh, my dad had tears in his eyes. I knew something was wrong. 
They said, quickly, son, get a few things together. Grandpa was involved in a very serious car accident. He's over at the hospital. We want to go see him. What had happened is my grandfather was on his way home from work, and he saw an accident on the side of the road, so he stopped to help. But someone under the influence drove around the corner and drove right into my grandfather and put him in the hospital. Very serious condition. He was in a semi-coma. And the doctor contacted the family and said, you need to come right away. He's not going to make it through the night. Uh, It does not look good. And so all the family gathered uh, at the hospital. Well, the strangest thing happened the next morning. uh, The doctor called the family and said, "Uh, you won't believe what has just happened. He he said, uh, your father, speaking to my parents, uh, he's come out of this coma. And what's more is he's sitting up in bed and he's actually asked for something to eat. He said, I've never seen this before in all of my practice. Well, just a few days after this, grandfather was released from the hospital and went home. Incredible recovery. So we gathered around the house, and of course, we were all praising the Lord, this wonderful thing that God had heard our prayers. And and my grandfather said, you know, I have something to tell you all. And we said, what is it? He said, I was lying there in the hospital bed, and I felt as though I was going to die. I felt as though my end was near, and I began to pray. And I prayed and I said, Lord, if I am ready to die, please reveal yourself to me in some way. If I'm ready to die, show me yourself. My grandfather said the next thing that he saw was a man dressed in a long white robe. And he assumed it was Jesus. He could see just from the waist down. And he looked and he thought, oh, there's Jesus. And he looked a little closer, but he noticed the feet of this person, of Jesus, were facing away from him. And so in desperation, he cried out and he said, but, but Lord, why are you looking away? He said, I've done all of these things for you in my life. I've been involved in church. I've, I've been a deacon at the church and we've done many things. Why are you looking away? And the voice came back to him and said, you were busy doing all of these things. But your first priority, which was your family, you had neglected. And those were true words. My grandfather was very busy. He hardly saw his children. He didn't have time to teach his family and teach his children about God. He was involved in church things, but he neglected his family. And so my grandfather prayed and he said, Oh, please, Lord, just just give me one more chance. One more chance. And the voice came back, You have one year. Well, the next day, my grandfather had this remarkable recovery. And he went home. And I remember even as a little boy, we would often on the weekends go visit Grandpa. And there was a decided change that came over Grandpa. He began to pull all the children together and the grandkids, and we'd climb up onto his, onto his lap, and he would talk about heaven. He'd say, children, do you know that Jesus loves you? Children, do you know that Jesus is coming again to take you home? He kept talking about Jesus and his love. And he would say, children, have you asked Jesus to forgive you for your sins? Yes, we'd say, yes, Grandpa, we did. Exactly one year after the accident, it was a Saturday morning, Grandpa sat up in bed, and he turned to Grandma and said, I think the end is here. And they called the preacher, and the preacher came by. One year, exactly after the event, Grandpa died. He actually wrote out his funeral, the songs that he wanted to have sung, and the scripture that he wanted to have read. It was his favorite scripture. It was John 14, 1 to 3. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, Jesus said. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Friends, I'm looking forward to that glorious resurrection morning. What about you? Do you have someone that you'll be looking for when Jesus comes? some dear friend, some family member that you have laid to rest. When Jesus comes, families will be reunited. Friends will meet again. That's the good news, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The Christian does not need to fear death because Jesus has the power to break the tomb open and call death's captors free. The gospel message is not due but it is come. It is not try, but it is come. It is not reform, but it is come. It is not improve yourself, but it is come. All through the gospel invitation is come. The feast is ready. 
come and eat. The water is gushing, come and drink. The forgiveness is provided, come and take. The love is free, come and enjoy it. Jesus said, come unto me, all he that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Yes, the Bible presents good news on the topic of death and even on the topic of hell. Even in the destruction of the wicked, God is still a God of love. Amen? Let's close with prayer. Dear Father, which art in heaven, we thank you once more for your word. And we thank you, Father, that we don't have to fear the grave if our lives have been covered by the blood of Christ, if we have committed ourselves to him. When that glorious resurrection morning comes, Jesus will awaken us from the sleep of the grave and take us home. Dear Lord, forgive us for our sins. Help us to trust in you. Send your spirit to live within us, to transform us, to make us into the kind of people that you would have us to be. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.